Hi, I'm Jacqueline. And I'm Courtney, and this is Caffeinated Crimes 100th episode edition. Whoop whoop! This is our 100th episode. I cannot believe it. I, it blows my mind. It really does. It still doesn't feel real that, like, we've done 100 episodes of this show. We're coming up on two years? Mm-hmm. Two years. Like, guys, that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. It is crazy. Um, Thank you all for sticking around with us, whether you're new, whether you've been here from the very beginning. Um, We love you guys. We appreciate you guys. We have so much fun with this, and we're so excited to be celebrating 100 episodes, so that is awesome. Yeah, and so we have a few little, like, fun facts kind of things that we're going to talk about. Um, So our most listens on an episode is our first episode, Ed Gein, no surprise, um, followed by Louise Woodward. Yeah. Which I think was the first time I was semi-drunk while recording, so (laughs) I guess people love it. (laughs) Maybe we should uh, rethink our our game plan here. (laughs) Our whole podcast plan. (laughs) Um, We have 18,659 total downloads, which is pretty pretty nice, pretty nice. Uh, Hopefully you can up it in the next... 100 episodes. Yes. Um, We have listeners in 69 nice countries (laughs) on six continents. So if you know anyone in Antarctica, tell them to listen so we can get that that rounded out seven. Yep. When you're out, like, you know, searching for your penguins or, like, ice fishing or whatever you do in Antarctica, you just pop in those earbuds and just listen to us and we'll just warm your soul while you're literally freezing. Yeah, and uh, we have now 100 episodes for you to back listen to, so you're good. (laughs) Which also, I mean, it makes sense that our first episode is the most listened to, but I'm like, man, all y'all just listen to that one, and then you're like, nope, I'm done. I'm not going to listen to them anymore. (laughs) I also feel like a lot of our friends and family were like, of course we're going to listen, and they listen to that episode, and they're like, I don't like podcasts. They're like, I was "Mm." just trying to be supportive, and then they just like dipped out. (laughs) Or you can be like Andrew, who downloads it every week and then just deletes it because he doesn't listen to us ever, but he downloads every week, so I appreciate that. Yeah, that's what counts. (laughs) Um, So our top five cities, number one is Knoxville, to the surprise of no one, because that's where we're from. Um, Second is Columbus, Ohio. Which Hmm. I found kind of shocking, because I don't really know anyone who lives in Columbus. No, me neither. That's interesting. So, thanks, Columbus, Ohio. (laughs) Uh, Number three is Atlanta, Georgia. Number four is the biggest shock of all time, (laughs) Warsaw, Mazovia. Mazovia. It's in Poland. Mm -hmm. So, they liked our our Polish episode. Which we did also chart in the true crime podcasts in Poland, which there probably aren't very many of them, but we did hit the top... 100 or something? I think. I can't remember the exact number, but we charted in Poland's true crime podcast category, so that's all that matters. So thank you, Poland. We love you too. (laughs) Thank you. We will do a Polish episode at some point again, and I'll butcher all the pronunciations, and I'm so sorry. Um... (laughs) No one emailed us to let us know that you fucked those up, so hopefully you did all right. I hope so. I tried. In my heart of hearts, they know I tried. (laughs) And five is Nashville, Tennessee. If you were so sad that your city wasn't mentioned, we'll get more friends to listen to us. So Yes, please do. We also uploaded all of our episodes on YouTube, which was a trip. (laughs) Um, (laughs) It's a a wild ride over there on YouTube, guys. It's wild. Some of you are so nice and pleasant and Mm -hmm. kiss, 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 kiss to you. And some of you guys are not nice. Like, <laughs> just stop. He's a but, bunch of assholes over there. <laughs> yeah. Most views on an episode there was Darlie Rudier. And it also has the most comments because people have strong opinions about that yeah. episode. So. Very much so. Um, and now, Jacqueline, what was your favorite episode? Okay. So, Courtney and I were talking before we recorded. We were going to do, like, a favorite of like our first 50 episodes and then a favorite of our last 50 episodes um so I'm gonna say my favorite from our first 50 was Keith Warren Mm -hmm. because I feel like that one's very um it doesn't get a lot of attention Mm -hmm. um so the fact that we were able to do that as one of our first ones and really talk about some of the details of the case I think it's an important one yeah so I think that's my favorite from the first 50 Okay. 
Uh, my favorite from the first 50 was Southside Strangler. Because mm, I thought that, that one that came one. together really well. And, like, mm-hmm. um, that's another one that, like, nobody really talks about. Like, it is solved. Yeah. It solved, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Guys, maybe we'll talk later, but... Your girl's got a lot of stuff going on. <laughs> anyway. Um, but, you know, it is solved, but, like, nobody talks mm-hmm. about it. This, like, person no. who's just, like, killing a bunch of people. And, I don't know, just the way it came together. I really liked how mm-hmm. that one was. So, Yeah, that one was a good one. Um, and then I think, and I'm probably, after we record this, I'm probably going to be like, oh, duh, this one is my actual favorite. Because it's so hard because, like, there's so many that, like, I really enjoyed. Um, but I think my favorite from the second 50 would be Raynella Leith mm-hmm. because I think that one was just so, there was just so much to it and it was like yeah. all over the place. Um, it's one that we sort of had roundabout connections to mm-hmm. as far as it taking place in Knoxville and like I know someone who knows her kind of, you know, so one of those situations. But I also felt like that one came together really well that it had a lot of like good information it flowed well and you know like one of those that at the end you're like yeah that was a good one versus sometimes at the end we're like that was shit but let's put it out anyway (laughs) yeah um that one was crazy and I do like how that one came together too like it it had so many twists and turns like you think like the death of her first husband is kind of crazy and then Mm -hmm. her second husband and then she tries to kill like someone else and (laughs) it's wild and then the whole corrupt judge and it it has like Mm -hmm. i don't know like if you had your true crime bingo card you'd get bingo like seven (laughs) times (laughs) um all of them (laughs) so my favorite in the second 50 was sneha philip so Mm. that was one that i just got sucked so into and i still think about like what happened to her um you know like did she start a new life? Did she die in 9-11? Mm-hmm. What happened to her? So that's one that I still think about, like, frequently. And I really thought that episode was, like, we did really well on that one. And it came together really well, too. So. Yeah, I agree. That one was really well done. That is funny that I choose a solved one in the first half and unsolved in the second. <laughs> and you chose an unsolved in the first and solved in the second. Mm. Unplanned, folks. Unplanned. Totally unplanned. <laughs> So, now, more importantly, Jacqueline, what was your least favorite episode? (laughs) I feel like we probably have the same least favorite. I think we do. (laughs) Do you want to say it on three? Yeah. Okay. One, two, three. (laughs) I-5 killer. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that one was rough. (sighs) It was... I don't even know what it was. It was just... It did not flow well it didn't come together well the audio it was just who that was our first two-parter if I remember correctly and I think we were still having trouble figuring out the flow of things and Mm -hmm. like the best way to story tell I guess like should we do it chronological should we do it like this and we were using the Anne Roll book who her books are amazing but she doesn't exactly go chronologically so it's kind of all mm-hmm. over the place and we were all over the place <laughs> I don't know maybe if I listen back again I'd be like I don't hate it as much but like mm-hmm. from my memories of everything surrounding that episode it was like everything was just kind of not great <laughs> yeah I agree it was just just not not the best but yeah I kind of I kind of do want to go back and listen to it and see if it's as bad as we remember or if it yeah. was you know um, you I just let my... us know if you listened and you were like, Oof, girls. <laughs> <laughs> de, de, de. Uh, or know. if that's your favorite episode. <laughs> I would be shocked. <laughs> um, I know my least favorite editing experience was Lacey Peterson because that was our um, second episode. I don't know why we didn't have this issue with the first episode, but we had some kind of issue with like sharing the Garage Band file and. Basically, this the podcast edits... almost ended before yeah. it started. Yeah, and Jack I... about to get in a fight. <laughs> if you guys have not heard the story before, I edited the podcast. I sent it to Courtney to listen and review, and she like made some notes about like, hey, here's some places where there's like some really long pauses and like all this stuff. And like, I went back and listened, and I'm like, I mean, it's 
it's like a, a few second pause. It's kind of conversational. Yeah. I don't like, feel I'm like I'm not going to take out when I like take a breath and I'm like <laughs> turning to Kevin and I'm like, I just counted. It's a seven second pause. <laughs> and then so, we realized uh, that we were not listening to the same thing. So yeah, yeah, it was uh, <laughs> quite the, quite the experience. And then I got to edit. I think it was three times I had to edit that episode. Like I'm pretty sure I did three full listen through edits yeah. because stuff just kept not transferring the right way so I was very glad when that got out <laughs> but but we did like um kind of figure out a better sharing of the episode system yes. after that so yes you live you learn I thought you were gonna say Jenna 6 when your mic oh uh, basically when we recorded it her yeah. mic the whole time made a noise and she had to go back and like re-record basically every single part that she said and just mm-hmm. talked to a recording of me talking and tried yes. to recreate us recording. <laughs> that one was, yeah, I feel like that's probably, Up those, there. those are probably tied for the worst yeah. editing experience. Cause yeah, that was, that was rough and it still didn't turn out great, but it turned out good it was enough. Listenable, you know, yeah. and it's one of those things like I've had this too when I'm editing and I have to re-record over a piece where I'm mm-hmm. like, this sounds like I re-recorded it, but it's like because mm-hmm. you know, yeah. So I think with that episode, because I knew, you I was like, it. oh, it kind of. But like, I feel like because Kevin was like, no, like because I was like, listen, like, does this sound like normal? He's like, yeah. So I was like, I think it's a mental thing where mm-hmm. I'm like, I feel like mentally I know, but maybe if you don't know, yeah, then you're good. And there also are times when I'm editing and like one of us will say something that like to me sounds like it was re-recorded, even though. I'm literally in the process of editing it, so I know it wasn't, but something in our, like, inflection or the volume or something is just, like, mm-hmm. slightly off where I'm like, hmm, I wonder when people listen to that if they think that that was re-recorded when it really wasn't, when we just spoke differently or louder or yeah. quieter or whatever, but. And then um, any future goals that you can think of at the moment? I know I have a few. Um, so this is our first recording actually in 2022. But, not but, that doesn't make sense. Um, so, I don't know where I was going with that. I'm just thinking ahead. My brain's not catching up with my mouth or the other way around. Anyway, so, <laughs> I just made my goals for, like, the year. So, I always have, like, a health goal, a financial goal, like, a personal goal, and now I have podcast goal. You know, so it's all broken down into that or whatever. But anyway, so my two goals for the podcast for this year is for us to get 200 downloads in an episode during the release week. So the week it's released, okay. 200 downloads that week. And I want to get to 20 patrons. Those okay. are my 2022 Caffeinated Crimes goals. So y'all make that happen. Courtney, what are your goals? Okay. My goals is to um, increase like our Instagram activity. Mm-hmm. Um, so I do try sometimes like when we release an episode to put like a poll or put like you know, answer some questions and people haven't been like very responsive with it. So Mm -hmm. I'm going to try to maybe do a few other things to see if we'll get like more responses and kind of like grow people's interactions on Instagram. Mm -hmm. Um, we did upload all of our TikToks to reels and we got a lot of activity there. So that was exciting. Maybe I'm going to try to do more like TikTok things. Mm -hmm. Um, maybe do more like a case in a minute kind of thing like people Mm -hmm. do like talk about something like really quickly like the you know give them like a little peek into an episode and maybe they'll go listen Mm -hmm. um but also eventually I don't know if it's going to happen this year I want to get like at least one sponsor on the podcast Mm -hmm. so that's a big goal is I want to get like at least one ad like one kind of thing like that so Mm -hmm. yeah those are good goals those are my three like big ones so hopefully this year I worked so much overtime in 2021 (laughs) that I felt like half the time I had no chance to breathe. So Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that'll stop this year and I can like really focus more on the podcast and not be working too much. (laughs) Yeah, I feel you. Okay, so now that we have done all of our fun, exciting stuff, um, we do have a few updates before we get into our episode for today. And we are recording a couple of weeks after we last recorded, so there may be some updates in here that we missed because, you know, the holidays and life and just flying by the seat of our pants, so sorry if we missed, Mm -hmm. but these are the big um, updates that we do have. 
So, um, very recently to this recording, Ghislaine Maxwell was found guilty on five of six counts, including sex trafficking a minor that she faced for the recruiting and grooming of teenage girls alongside Jeffrey Epstein. So, um, that has been like a pretty big case that's been talking about. Um, I think there was a lot of speculation of, is she going to quote, kill herself quote, like Mm -hmm. Jeffrey Epstein did. I know they named some names in the trials, um. But yeah, she was found not guilty on one count of enticement of an individual under age of 17 to travel with intent to engage in illegal sexual activity. Say that five times fast. (laughs) That is a mouthful. Um, She does face up to 65 years in prison, so I think she will be sentenced soon. Um, And a lot of what I see people talking about on Twitter, too, is like she was recruiting and grooming these girls for people. Mm -hmm. So we need to hold those people accountable, too. Like, obviously, Jeffrey Epstein was, like, one of the biggest names, but, like, a lot of names were dropped in the trial, and those people need to be held accountable because, like, you don't do this unless you have a consumer, basically. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, like, you're doing this for someone. So hold those people accountable because if you're, like, having sex with teenage girls who've been sex trafficked, like, Mm -hmm. you're a terrible human being. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I do wonder, like, what her sentence actually will be because, Mm -hmm. you know, we know how this usually goes with these high-profile cases. So I was honestly shocked that she was found guilty of the majority of the charges in the first place. So we'll see what the uh, sentencing looks like there. I wonder if it's going to be a Derek Chauvin thing where they're making Mm -hmm. her an example Mm -hmm. and they're being like, look. She was a big part of it. We found her guilty and slammed the book at her when they're ignoring all the other stuff. Yeah. So that's what I worry about is that they're just kind of like making an example of her, but Mm -hmm. not actually going to follow up on everything else. Yeah, I agree. Um, Also, on December 23rd, um, police in Las Vegas tried to pull over a truck that refused to stop. Um, So then he kept driving. Um... They pursued Chase. He was, like, throwing stuff out of his vehicle to, like, try to get them to stop. Um, So they were finally able to capture him. Um, They found that his truck was reported stolen. Um, It was driven by Eric Holland. And in the process of arresting him, they opened coolers that were in the back of his truck bed to find a human head and other remains. So... Not uh, a whole lot of details about that yet, um, but obviously he is uh, currently being held in jail while they uh, yeah. investigate this further. But yeah, that's imagine just a, a routine traffic stop, and then you gotta chase him down, and then you find a head in the in a cooler. You're like, the... what's in this cooler? Is it some beer? Hmm. Oh, hmm. No, no, no. that's not no. a good day at work. Oof, that's. <laughs> Yeah, I don't even have words for that. Like, no. <laughs> just imagining. Just like, ugh. Yeah. Whew. So, yeah, that'll be very interesting to see what comes of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and we do, this isn't really true crime related, but it has to be mentioned. Oh, yeah. um, the sweet, wonderful, mm. amazing Betty White did pass away on New Year's Eve um, <sighs> at the age of 99. She was just a few weeks away from our 100th birthday. Um And honestly, I kind of just sobbed like a baby at all of, like, the Golden Girls things about how, Mm -hmm. like, they're all together again and, like, Mm. ugh, like, all the videos. I'm getting emotional, guys. I don't know. (laughs) Life's been hard the past few days. Anything's going to make me break at this point. Um. (laughs) I also feel like the last few years, everything has been like, this is shit, this is shit, but at least we still have Betty White, and now it's Mm -hmm. like, and now we don't even have Betty White. Like, Andrew and I were standing... um, at this, uh, it's like cupcake place. So they have like a little like outdoor like place where you can mm-hmm. like order and stuff. And so we'd like ordered our stuff and like we're like waiting. And then Andrew's like, "Oh shit, Betty White died." And I was like, "What?" Like I literally and like I l- immediately pull out my phone to text Courtney, who had texted me before I could finish the text <laughs> to her. Um, yeah. And it was just like so shocking. Like it's one like it's one of those moments. It's like I will always remember where I was when I found out mm-hmm. Betty White died. Like it's just such a like huge like thing you know and it's been like let's protect her at all costs and like i see some people being like 
oh, it's 2022 so bad that Betty White is like, <laughs> nope, not doing it. Or people, I also saw people being like, is 2022 going to be so good that Betty White was like, I'm not going to ruin it for you guys? Mm-hmm. Like, obviously this too. is like, I mean, I don't, I think she, she was 99. She yeah. did just do an interview about her good health, but she was older and she probably was going to, at some point, I mean, mm-hmm. we're all going to die someday. Um <laughs> But I think it is a lot of symbolism for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Um, I've seen little, like, cartoons where people are like, how could she not make it to, like, 100? And it's like, imagine how amazing your life is if people, like, you're 99 and people haven't had enough of you. Like, it's so, I don't know. Rest in peace, Betty White. And um, thoughts out to her family because that's so hard. That's such such a loss. Yeah, especially, like, any time, you know, deaths happen around the holidays, it's, like, it just makes it extra yeah. hard, and especially, like, every year after, you know, like, that's going to be even more difficult. Um, speaking of difficult situations and keeping people in our thoughts, um, there were some horrendous fires in Boulder, Colorado this past weekend. Um, the last we saw, like, around a thousand homes were destroyed. Um, no reported deaths, but three people are missing, um, so... Unfortunately, several days later, it is likely that those people um, did pass away in those fires, but they have not been found yet, but tons and tons of destruction. And then immediately after these fires, a giant snowstorm. So it's just like, it's it's just crazy. Yeah. Um, And just so scary. I mean, I remember when we had wildfires and I wasn't even really that close. I mean relatively close like I didn't have to worry about my home or anything but Mm -hmm. like how scary it was just being like I can see like the smoke I can see you know yeah and like knowing people like are struggling and stuff it's so scary and it's so devastating on Mm -hmm. a community yeah it really is um yeah so now that we've done all of our fun 100th episode stuff and now all of our updates and we're like 25 minutes into this episode Um, but we do want to give a very special exciting shout out to our newest patron Lisa Um, so welcome to our patreon family we are so happy to have you Um, just as a reminder you guys want to go to patreon.com slash caffeinated crimes you can get bonus episodes Um, we do have goodies we have like quarterly gifts for some of our tiers and monthly hangouts and just all kinds of fun stuff over there. Um, so we do want to welcome Lisa to that. And thank you so, so much for supporting this podcast because we could not do it without all of our patrons. Yes. It warms our heart when we have a new person in our little Patreon family. So thank you so much for joining. So our resources for today are FBI.gov, an article on there, crimemuseum.org, all that's interesting, and the littlebohemialodge.com. So for our 100th episode, we decided to do like an old-timey gangster to try and take a little bit of a lighter, quote-unquote, take. Um, Sometimes these older ones you can kind of have a little bit more fun with. Um, So today we are going to be talking about the infamous Babyface Nelson. So... Babyface Nelson was not born Babyface Nelson. That's not his legal name. Wait a minute. You're telling me his mom did not birth this human and say, Babyface, that's it. That's the name. No, she did even worse and named him Lester (laughs) Joseph Gillis. (laughs) Guys, Courtney did the research for this episode, and I went to look at something else, and I was like, okay, how did I not know that Babyface Nelson's name was Lester Joseph Gillis. Yeah. Like, what a name. What a name. For a gangster. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Um, so he was born on December 6, 1908 in Chicago, Illinois. As an early teen, he'd roamed the streets of Chicago with a juvenile gang. And by the age of 14, he had accomplished a car theft. Um, and so this is around the time he started getting that nickname, like Babyface, because he looked so young um i think later i like we bring up his height and weight but he like had a very like childish appearance like he looked so young and he also was quite literally a child at this point (laughs) so very true (laughs) so if you're 14 and your gang is like i'm calling you baby face because you look young so you probably look an eight (laughs) you look like an eight year old um so he would go by Babyface nelson or sometimes george nelson later in life no idea where the Nelson portion came from. I couldn't find any, like, pointing mm-hmm. to it. I guess he was, like, babyface Nelson. 
Baby Love face it. Gillis. So, I like it. <laughs> baby face Gillis. <laughs> That's so bad. Lester Nelson. Um, <laughs> ooh. I'm sorry if your name is Lester. It's not that terrible of a name, but like when you're as infamous as like Babyface Nelson and then you find out your name is Lester Gillis, like whew, Lester man. Gillis. Wow. That's Again, if your name is Lester Gillis, I'm so sorry. Please don't reach out to us. Maybe, maybe you should reach out to us. I don't know. Just, yeah, anyway. do tell us we're being terrible people because <laughs> we probably are. Anyway, um, so his early criminal career also included stealing tires, running stills, bootlegging, and armed robbery. So he's just... He's hitting all the points. Mm -hmm. And in 1922, he was convicted of auto theft and was committed to a boy's home. So two years later, he was released on parole. However, he was back within five months on a similar charge. So in 1928, Babyface met a saleswoman, Helen Wazanek. Wazanek. Ugh, I'm sorry, Helen. If I pronounced that wrong. Um... They got married, and she did change her name to Helen Gillis. She wasn't Helen Nelson. She was Helen Gillis. (laughs) Um, And they had a child on April 27th, 1929, named Ronald Vincent Gillis. There was also reported an occasion in early 1930 where Babyface and his accomplices raided the home of a wealthy magazine owner and made off with jewelry that'd be worth about $3 million today. And later that year, it was also reported he stole an enormous amount of jewelry from the mayor of Chicago's wife. Um, I mean, I don't know how true these are, but Mm -hmm. when you read everything else he does, like, it kind of makes sense if he did. Yeah. (laughs) So, in January 1931, Babyface committed bank robbery in Chicago, and he was sentenced to one year to life in prison, (laughs) which I thought was the weirdest sentence. You know, just somewhere in there. I don't know. Whatever. You You decide. You year, and then we'll see. Maybe (laughs) maybe you won't leave, but maybe you will. Um... So after one year, he was removed from Illinois State Penitentiary to stay in trial for another bank robbery in uh, Wheaton, Illinois. And on February 17th, 1932, Babyface escaped prison guards while they were returning him to Illinois State Penitentiary. And after a brief stay in Reno, Nevada, he went to Sausalito, California. Sausalito. Probably should have looked that up before I started this. Sorry. Oh, well. Um, Oh, well. So this is where he met John Paul Chase, who he would be close acquaintances with for the rest of his life. Um, So John Paul Chase was born on December 16th, 1901, and had lived most of his life in California. And he attended school through fifth grade, then worked at a ranch near San Rafael, California. Um, And John would later go to work in railway shops for four years. So, in 1930, John became associated with a liquor smuggling operation comprised of persons with underground connections. That's supposed to say underworld connections, but I think that kind of applies either way. I mean, it kind of makes sense. I mean... Courtney, Courtney, are you you reading okay today? uh... No. (laughs) I'm not okay. 20... End of 2021-2022 is... uh, Not off to a great great. start. (laughs) Not that great. So, anyway... Hey, both made sense, I guess. Yeah. I think underground connection sounds better than underworld connections, because underworld, it's like, what is this, Thor or some shit? Anyway. <laughs> like, what does this even mean? What what type of connections are we referring to? <laughs> yeah. Is this, like, demons, <laughs> or is it just criminals? <laughs> Do we have, like a, like, a Ouija board, like, this kind of, like, underworld, or, like... You know, yeah. people who are like drinking liquor during prohibition. Like, what are we? What are we referring what are we talking to? About here? Which ones? <laughs> <laughs> so, when Babyface arrived in California, John was still working with the liquor smuggling operation, um, and so Babyface worked with John as an armed guard for the truck used to illegally transport the liquor. So the two men became very close, and John often referred to Babyface as his half brother. So he'd be like, "Yeah, it's my half brother," even though they had no actual like. Kind of, like, relation. As far as I know, I mean. I mean, true. Who knows? <laughs> Who knows what Mama Gillis was doing out there? <laughs> she was naming her kid Lester Gillis, so, you know, all bets are off. Who knows what she got into? I know. Ooh, man. So, Helen joined Babyface in California, and they remained in California until May of 1933, So, John stayed in Sausalita, and Babyface moved to Long Beach, Indiana, where he lived for several months. So, while he's in Indiana, Babyface met several other criminals, including Homer Van Meter, 
And then he would occasionally go with them to San Antonio, Texas. And so this is kind of believed where Babyface could have met with the John Dillinger gang around this time. And I'm sure we've all heard of John Dillinger. And I'm sure we'll cover him at some point. But Mm -hmm. pretty notorious guy. So in December 1933, it seems Babyface and John Chase met back up and remained together for about a year. And around this time, a man was shot and killed in Minneapolis. And so the perpetrators were reported in an automobile with California license plate that was eventually tracked back to Babyface. So they're just great and mayhem wherever they go. Mm-hmm. And they do travel a lot. You'll see. <laughs> <laughs> So Babyface and John eventually went to Bremerton, Washington, and then Reno, Nevada. And John later said in an interview that Babyface killed a man in an altercation while they were in Reno, and the victim was a material witness in a United States mail fraud case. So don't really know, like, the official connection. Like, if it was like, oh, you're a part of this case, so I'm going to kill you, or Mm -hmm. you just so happened to be a part of this case, and I killed you. Yeah. So in April 1934, the men made their way back to Chicago with Helen, and at this time, they joined the Dillinger gang officially. So Babyface and Helen actually vacationed with the Dillinger gang at the Little Bohemia Lodge in Wisconsin, um, and the FBI learned of the gang's location on April 22nd, and special agents went to the Little Bohemia Lodge. So barking dogs alerted the gang to FBI's presence, and so agents opened fire and bullets were just flying everywhere. Uh, But the gang did escape in the dark, but they did leave behind a few female associates, including Helen, so they did leave her behind. Like, what the hell? You can't just leave your women behind? (laughs) I mean, come on. They're like, y'all be fine. You're women. Show your boobs. You're fine. (laughs) Um, (laughs) Also, a little fun fact. The Little Bohemia Lodge is still open today, and you can visit it. Um, And they do have a slogan on their website that says, remember, Dillinger only left because he had to. (laughs) Which... I thought it was pretty clever. Um, That's funny. So Babyface fled to a nearby home and forced his way in with two hostages. So shortly after, special agents J.C. Newman and W. Carter Bohm arrived at the scene with a local constable. Um, and when the car stopped, Babyface ran to the car and demanded they get out. And then at this point, Babyface was only 5'4 and 133 pounds. So like I said, he's very small. Mm-hmm. Very tiny guy. Um, So before the three men could comply, Babyface shot all of them and killed Special Agent Newman instantly. So within a short time, John Chase rejoined Babyface, um, and Helen did go to jail for her being there, I guess, at the Little Bohemia Lodge. Because you just left your women behind. I mean, come on. Now she got to go to jail? Clearly showing their boobs did not work. Their boobs did not work (laughs) at all. (laughs) So she was released on parole and joined up with them a month later. So at this point, they lived near Lake Geneva, Wisconsin for several days. And on June 23rd, 1934, Attorney General Homer S. Cummings offered a reward for Babyface's capture or information leading to his arrest. And on June 30th, Babyface John Dillinger and Homer Van Meter robbed a Merchants National Bank in South Bend, Indiana. So during this robbery, a police officer was shot and killed. So, following this, they fled back to Chicago, where another shootout occurred, and two police officers were killed on Wolf Road when Babyface opened fire as they approached the gang's meeting place. So, John Dillinger was shot and killed on July 22nd. So, at this point, the founder of the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, who's a terrible guy, but that's a story for another day, now (laughs) called Babyface Nelson public enemy number one. So, John Dillinger was before that, and now it's Babyface Nelson is public enemy number one. Uh, Pretty, pretty Mm -hmm. big title. So, after this, Babyface, Helen, and John Chase moved to California with two associates. And that summer, they made a lot of trips between California and Chicago. And on one occasion, they were arrested for speeding in a small town. They paid the $5 fine and were released. Um... Their car that was full of machine guns, rifles, and ammunition was not searched because this is the 1930s, and I guess they just had no way of getting this information out to these small towns. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, we don't know who you are. Like, you're speeding. Okay, here's your fine. Move on about your day. Oh, you're going to pay your fine? Okay, bye. Have fun. Yeah. <laughs> In late August, the gr- group returned to Chicago. Within a month, 
Babyface went back to Nevada and John went to New York City. Such travelers. Like, they're just all over the place. I don't know how you're affording your gas. <laughs> all over the place. And, I mean, think about how long it takes to, like, drive between all of these places today. Like, in the 1930s when mm-hmm. your car's going, like, 30 miles an hour. Like, good lord. Like, it would take forever to get there. And, and you're just, you like, don't have, zipping. like, interstates and stuff. Like, yeah. you just kind of have, like, back roads. Like, little two-lane back roads. Like, crazy. Yeah. Like, you must be in the car all the time. <laughs> A lot of traveling. So, in continuing their never-ending travels, the two met back up in Minden, Nevada on October 10th, 1934. Um, They then went back to Chicago, where they stole a car on November 26th and drove to Wisconsin. So, Inspector Samuel P. Cowley of the FBI's Chicago office was assigned to search for Babyface. And on November 27th, Cowley received word that Babyface was in a stolen car. So, two special agents spotted the car near Barrington, Illinois. So, Babyface brought the car around the agents, and John fired five rounds from automatic rifles into the agent's car. Um, One of the agents returned fire, and one shot hit the radiator of Nelson's car, which partially disabled it. So, Cowley and Special Agent Herman Edward Hollis, which is quite a strong name. I mean, that's a very, like, powerful name there. Um, So, they approached in another automobile and began pursuing Babyface and John. Suddenly, Babyface veered off the Northwest Highway at the entrance to the Northside Park in Barrington, Illinois, and stopped. Before Cowley and Hollis could get out of the car, Babyface and John began firing automatic weapons at them. Hollis was killed during the gun battle, which lasted about four or five minutes, and Cowley was fatally wounded and died the next morning. Babyface was also badly injured in this shootout. So John helped him into Callie's car, and they transferred guns and articles into the car as well. Um, Helen had been lying in a field while the shootout was going on, so she ran over and jumped in the car as John was driving away. So again, they're just trying to leave Helen behind. I mean, she had to, like, chase him down and yeah. get back in the car. Like, good lord. She's like, I'm trying to be a ride or die, but you just keep leaving me. <laughs> you just want, I can't you ride. You just want me to die. You're not about the ride part. <laughs> Um, so Babyface Nelson died around 8 p.m. that day, and he was 25 years old, which it always shocks me when we do these, like, old-timey, mm-hmm. like, gangster, um, cases, because it's like, they're so young, like, when you look at everything they go through, yeah. and you're like, and they're only 25, like. Yeah, like, when I saw that, I was like, 25, like, jeez, yeah. like, you were out here with shootouts and <laughs> killing people and all this, and you're just 25, yeah. like, oh, it's crazy. Wow. So, an anonymous phone call was made to the FBI, and they found Babyface's body near Niles Center Cemetery. Um, Helen was arrested on November 29th because she had violated her parole, so she was sentenced to one year and one day in the Women's Federal Reformatory. So, in total, Babyface had killed three FBI agents, which was the most of anyone, and we believe he still holds that record today. Um, And after John dumped Babyface's body, he returned to Chicago. On November 30th, he responded to an ad for a job driving cars to Seattle, Washington. So to get this job, he had to be photographed at the police station while obtaining his chauffeur's license. Um, And John only had one previous charge for public drunkenness in 1931. So there weren't like, you know, wanted posters with like his picture, his fingerprints. Like he wasn't really known as part of like this gang. Like he just kind of flew under the radar. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's no like security Mm -hmm. cameras. There's no really even cameras at all yeah. to like take photographs like not like mm-hmm. common use you know so that's just like oh we don't know that you are a part of this like huge yeah. gang that just killed three yeah. fbi agents so in early december special agents of the fbi's san francisco office contacted john's former employers and associates and they were instructed to notify the fbi if they saw him So, on December 27th, John tried to borrow money from employees from a former job, and the FBI and local police were immediately notified, and John was arrested. On December 31st, John was taken to Chicago, where he was the first person to be tried under law that made it a federal violation to murder a special agent of the FBI in the performance of his duties. So, John's trial began on March 18th, 1935, and one week later, the jury found him guilty of the murder of Samuel Cowley. He was in prison starting on March 31st at Alcatraz, and John was eventually sent to the United States Penitentiary... Penitentiary... 
Pen- penitentiary? It's it's a hard word. Penitentiary, <laughs> yeah. In Leavenworth. A lot of E's and I's on that. I know, goodness. <laughs> um, so that was in Leavenworth, Kansas, and that happened in September of 1954. So in 1935, he was only tried for the murder of Sam Cowley, but now 20 years later, they wanted to charge him for the murder of Herman Edward Hollis as well. So on April 27th, 1955, a motion was filed saying to either charge him immediately or dismiss the charges. So like, you can't keep kind of hanging out in this limbo. Yeah, I mean, it's been 20 years. Yeah. Like, if you're going to charge him, charge him. Yeah. So a U.S. District... <laughs> U.S. District Judge dismissed the indictment. Holy shit, that sentence. Okay. Mm -hmm. Dismissed the indictment on October 17th. Um, He said that John's knowledge of the indictment and failure to take action did not constitute a waiver of his right to a speedy trial. So while pending this dismissal, John was actually up for parole. Um, Parole had been denied many times before, but he was officially granted parole on October 31st, 1966. After his release, he lived in California, where he worked as a custodian for over six years, and he did die of cancer on October 5th, 1973. Helen Gillis died on July 3rd, 1987. Um, Her and Babyface are both buried in St. Joseph Cemetery in River Grove, Illinois. Um, Their son, Ronald Gillis, died on February 14th, 1999. Babyface has also been highly glamorized and portrayed in pop culture, as we saw with Bonnie and Clyde. Um, There was a 1957 movie starring Mickey Rooney called Babyface Nelson. There was also a 1959 movie called FBI Story that had James Stewart in it. Um, William Phipps portrayed Babyface. There was a 1973 film called Dillinger that had Babyface Nelson in it, portrayed by Richard Dreyfuss. It was apparently pretty historically inaccurate, which is not surprising. Yeah. Common theme with these, I'm sure. (laughs) They're like, oh yeah, we'll just take a few basic ideas and just go with it. Just create, Mm -hmm. just create your own story. You don't even have to like pretend like it's, you know, based (laughs) on Choose your own adventure. (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. So Elliot Street portrayed Babyface in a 1975 TV movie called Kansas City Massacre. There was another movie in 1995 called Babyface Nelson, starring C. Thomas Howell. Um, Courtney's personal favorite is Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Where Michael... Bataluco? Bataluco? Pretty sure it's that, but I don't know. (laughs) Mm -hmm. We're just going to go with that. So he plays Babyface. (laughs) Um, This movie... Um, has him alone before meeting up with the main characters where they tag along on a bank robbery. Um, He is played as having um, like a bipolar disorder. He's very happy and thrill-seeking when robbing and then quickly falls into a depression afterwards. Um, He is later led by an angry mob to the electric chair. So really the only similarities between this movie and his actual life is the name and the bank robbing. Robbing. Robbery. Anyway. Uh, we we on the struggle bus in 2022. <laughs> um, so, A Brother Where Art Thou is actually set in 1937 in Mississippi. So, this is, like, after Babyface's death. And we don't think he was ever in Mississippi. So, they just kind of took a few small pieces and, again, just ran with it. But, great movie. So, <laughs> yeah. Very good movie. Um, Another very popular movie is Public Enemies, which stars Johnny Depp. Um, Babyface is portrayed by Stephen Graham. Um, This movie is also inaccurate, big shocker, um, and has him dying at the Little Bohemia shootout. So they actually filmed this part of the movie at the Little Bohemia Lodge. Um, We hear it's a great movie, even though it is not accurate. But again, you can enjoy a movie even if it's not, you know, um, based on the real events. And finally, there was an A&E drama series named Babyface. So, again, plenty of um, instances of him and his gang in pop culture just doing their thing. Um, Yeah, so that is the story of Babyface Nelson and his many murders, bank robberies, general mayhem and his death at the age of 25 yeah and i was shocked um i tried looking it up the best i could but it does seem like he still holds the record for the most amount of like fbi agents killed which i was like that's Mm -hmm. kind of crazy like i didn't know that Um, yeah so 
I mean, maybe there's someone else, and I just couldn't find it. I did try to look, couldn't find it. But, um, yeah, you'll mm-hmm. have to let us know if you know someone who's killed more FBI agents than three. So, <laughs> <laughs> don't rat out your neighbor I, down like, the street. I'll turn them in, but... <laughs> um, like, in my head, I'm like, I know we mean, like, you know of someone, like, yeah. you've heard... But then I'm like, I'm also, you know, oh, yeah, my, my friend Bobby over here, I know he killed four FBI agents. I will no turn him knows. in. I'm going to let y'all know. I will turn him in. <laughs> yes, we don't we don't keep those secrets here at Caffeinated Crimes. Um, yeah, so that is this week's episode for our 100th Such a Fun Celebration. Um, Courtney, what is your first perk of the week for 2022? Okay, so my perk of the week is just that it was Christmas and I got to see Kevin's mm-hmm. family and spend time with my family. And it was so nice to like be with everyone for the holidays. Um, but I am going to pull kind of a double perk of the week because, you know, 2022, <laughs> two, we need two. Yes. Um, oh, I like it. And my perk of the week, I've mentioned it many times, is my vaccine and booster because if y'all <laughs> noticed, I've been struggling. Your girl has COVID. So I didn't know if I was going to tell you guys, but I've felt a lot of shame and guilt. And so maybe if I talk about it, other people will feel less bad when you have Mm -hmm. your vaccine and your booster and you wear a mask and you still get COVID. Um, I didn't think I had it. I thought I just had allergies or a cold. So if you think you're sneezing a lot and you have a runny nose, get tested. Um, Mm -hmm. Because I genuinely didn't think I had it. (laughs) Like. Yeah, especially with the new variant, it seems like the symptoms are, I'm not saying completely different, but Mm -hmm. very different from, like, the signature, like, fever, cough, shortness of breath, that everyone's like, look out for these, and then now it's like, oh, now it just looks like a cold, you know? Yeah, and, like, I had a cold around Thanksgiving, and it's, like, a lot of the same symptoms, and so I was like, I didn't Mm -hmm. think it was, Um, and then I did take an at-home test, and it was, like, very positive very very Mm -hmm. very very dark line of you have covid (laughs) um so yeah and courtney sent it to me and i had to do a double take because i thought she was telling me she was pregnant (laughs) so and i was very mad that she would just send me a picture instead of calling me or you know whatever anyway uh shout out to my co-worker caitlin also also, who I sent it to and texted me and was like, how are you feeling? What are you going to do? I'm supporting you. What do you need to do? I am here for you. How are you feeling? And I was like, I'm so sorry. It was a COVID test. And she was like, oh my God. She was like, I had so much anxiety running through my body, but she was like, what do you need? I'm here for you. I mean, the tests look very similar. It does. It looked just like a pregnancy (laughs) test. Um, So sorry for anyone who thought I was pregnant. I'm not. I have COVID. Um, But yeah, so if you have like congestion, a runny nose, you can't stop sneezing, um, drainage, all that, like do just go get a COVID test to just be sure because Mm -hmm. yeah, I never lost my taste. I never lost my smell. I have some other kind of weird symptoms that are coming out, but like... Mm-hmm. The whole time I was like, I can still smell things. Like, I don't have COVID, but yeah, I had COVID, so. Just your friendly reminder to get your vaccines and get your booster because, yeah, you may still get COVID, but here's Courtney still working out this morning, <laughs> recording a podcast, doing yeah. all the normal things because she has mild symptoms because she got her vaccine and her booster, and like, so. I was honestly thinking ding, ding. about that. I felt a lot of emotions the past few days about all of this, but it's like, I wasn't feeling great. And I'm like, how bad would it have been if I did not have my Mm -hmm. vaccine? Because I have had like asthma in the past and stuff. And I'm like, I already kind of just like don't feel great. Like it's not terrible, but it's like, I mean, it feels like a cold. Like it feels like when you have a cold and you just feel Mm -hmm. crummy. But I'm like, it could be so, so bad. Like if I did not have my vaccine, like thankfully I've had no trouble breathing. I've had no chest pain, like none of that. And I'm like, Mm -hmm. so thankful because like it could be so bad. Yeah. So if you're one of those people who is not getting vaccinated because vaccinated people are still getting COVID, just remember this, that Mm -hmm. COVID looks very different in vaccinated and unvaccinated people, even though both groups are currently getting it, especially with this new variant, but your symptoms are much more mild. So just, just remember that, remember that your first, uh, 2022 uh, vaccine plug, which I think we did in our (laughs) last episode where you guys heard it. And now I'm like, definitely get it because- you still get COVID, guys. Um, yes. But yeah, I felt like a lot of emotion with it. Um, 
just mm-hmm. kind of like, wow, I'm so lucky. I have mild symptoms. And it's like, no, I'm not lucky. Like I was smart and got a vaccine. And then it's, it's a mm-hmm. lot, you know, and you have something that's like killed like millions of people. And you're just like, yeah, it's a mind fuck guys. I'm also about to start my period. Yeah. So a lot of emotions going on. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> or she's pregnant. Who knows? <laughs> nope. No, no, no. I can't handle that right now. I'm not at a place to handle that at this moment. I think I think Courtney is less upset about her positive COVID <laughs> than she would be about a positive pregnancy test. Yeah. I want to drink at my wedding, guys. I don't want to be pregnant at my wedding. That would suck. Courtney's like, I already got my dress. I already got it altered. No. Like, we can't do it. We can't. I cannot plan for this right now, but... <laughs> um, yeah, now that I've talked for probably way too long about all of that, Jacqueline, what is your perk of the week? <laughs> um, so my perk of the week is just the general that it is a new year. Um, I love a new year. It's very, uh, it's like a fresh start. You get a new planner. I love a planner. Mm-hmm. I love having a new planner. I love like writing out like all my stuff in the calendar for the year and just, you know, it just feels like a fresh start, new goals, looking back at the goals you achieved last year. You know, it's like it's like a Monday morning, but on like a much bigger scale, yeah. and and it's not um, as depressing getting out of bed, you know, because you're usually off. Well, I'm usually off. You retail workers and um, healthcare and police and fire and all those people who have to work holidays. I'm very sorry, but we are very grateful for everything that all of you do. Um, I don't know where I was going with this. It just kind of rambled out of control, but. <laughs> That is my perk of the week is that I just, I love a new year and, um, you know, hopefully, hopefully there are good things in store this year. I mean, last year had some really shitty moments, but it had some really amazing moments too, which I feel like is how most years usually Mm -hmm. go. But hopefully in general, the world is on an upswing this year, maybe. Hopefully. And yeah, I mean, there's going to be like perks of this year and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of like downs this year. I mean... I'm starting mm-hmm. the year with COVID and I can't leave my house. Like, <laughs> it's not exactly how I planned. Um, but mm-hmm. I'm hoping, like, this will kind of be, like, you know, starting a little low and so it can build. But maybe it's starting low and we go lower. We'll see. No expectations. Just making you, just giving you realistic expectations for the year is yeah. what it's doing. <laughs> it is always fun. Like, you come January and you're like, okay, it's a new year. Like, what are my goals? And, like, what am I going to do? Um and also, if you make these big New Year's resolutions and then you quit them two weeks later, that's okay, too. It really it's is. It's okay. Yes. Um, you know, you can just build consistency in other ways, and that's fine. Don't, don't And if uh, you don't even set goals or resolutions, that's fine, too. I mean, it's yeah. whatever works for you. I love a goal. I love, like, a mm-hmm. putting it down in a checklist and a this and that. And other people don't. Other people have no desire to you know, think of something like that to live their life in that manner. And that's perfectly fine. I also have to say, I'm working on decluttering my house and it's very, um, soothing, freeing. Yeah. Like, I don't know the word I'm looking for. Satisfying. There we go. Um, I don't have COVID. I just have mom brain, but (laughs) so it is very satisfying to like, like Courtney, look at this. Sorry guys. This is a podcast, but this is all shit that I'm getting out of my house. Nice. Well, that's going in the attic. But these, yeah, is stuff that is um, being donated. Also have, like, a trash bag. And that's literally just my room and Millie's room. Like, Mm -hmm. it's mostly just clothes. Yeah. (laughs) But Yeah, my parents uh, have been, like, getting rid of stuff because they just had, like, a bunch of stuff built up. And my mom's like, just get it out. Throw it away. Throw it away. Throw it away. Throw it away. Yep. (laughs) And it's, uh, I'm very proud of myself. I'm getting rid of these super cute dresses that I've had for literally 10 years now Mm -hmm. that I have not worn in literally a decade that every year when I clean out stuff, I'm like, this is super cute. I may wear it. Jacqueline, you're never going to wear that damn dress. Throw it away. So I did. I mean, I'm donating. I didn't throw it away. But, you know, I'm very proud of myself. Anyway, this is too. I do that with a lot of stuff of like, I'll fit into this one day when I lose some more weight. And I'm like, no, I wore this when I was like 14. I have boobs now. I'm not going to fit into that. (laughs) (laughs) 
no. Or like I have this shirt that's super cute. I love it. I always keep it because I'm like, but I hate it. It's very uncomfortable to wear. Mm-hmm. Like it's adorable, but I literally never wear it because it's like lace and it's like scratchy and like yeah. it's cute, but I, I'm not going to wear it. And I'm like, no, get rid of it. You don't, you haven't worn this in, wearing, wearing this in eight years. We need to, okay, let's wrap this. <laughs> so if you want to tell us about your new year's resolutions, <laughs> about your vaccines, about how you have COVID, maybe don't make me feel so bad because guys, the guilt is real. Um, you can do so at Instagram at caffeinated crimes pod on Twitter at calf crimes pod. That's C A F F crimes pod. We are on Facebook caffeinated crimes podcast. That's the same on YouTube is the caffeinated crimes podcast caffeinated crimes on TikTok. Um, you can send us an email at caffeinated crimes pod at gmail.com. If you feel so inclined to help us start out the year with meeting one of our goals and you want to join Patreon Mm -hmm. at any level, any level, there's a $3 level up to a $20 level with varying degrees of things you get in those levels. Um, you can Mm -hmm. do so at patreon.com slash caffeinated crimes. And if you want to make our year already starting out, you can leave us a review at Apple Podcasts. If you got a new iPhone for Christmas and you're just dying to do stuff with it, mm-hmm. um, hello, my brother and his wife, who I don't think have left us reviews yet, even though I told you like three weeks ago yeah, when you got your iPhone. Leave us a review. I'm probably going to text you after we uh, after we stop recording. Anyway, if you are those people, go leave us a review on the little purple thing where you listen to podcasts on your iPhone. And we are like six ish, I, I think. Last six I saw away. Six, yeah. Six reviews away from hitting 50, and when we do that, we are going to do a drawing for a pin, a sticker, and a $10 gift card to the coffee shop of your choice. Um, if that happens in the next, I don't know, what, five days, it's going to, nope, that's not how this happened. I was going to make a joke about Courtney being in quarantine, but this comes out after Courtney's out of quarantine. Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> you'll get that stuff, you know, ASAP, as soon as Courtney can get to the post office and mail it. Mm-hmm. But go do that, so that way you can be a part of that drawing and make our 2022 st- off on a good foot. Yes. Um, but in the meantime, go have a cup of coffee. And don't commit a crime. Mm-hmm.